and welcome to our webinar slash workshop on creative ethnographic methods in the Middle East. I am Fulia Punaj, um, the Alomran Family Postdoctoral Scholar at Brown University Center for Middle East Studies. As the organizer of this event, I would like to start with expressing my gratitude to our speakers, audience, and our administrative and coordination team for their support, especially as I had to reschedule this event multiple times in solidarity with calls for strike and support of Palestinians. While disruptions and programming are expected during times like this, I appreciate you all for your commitment as we figure things out. Today we have four uh, distinguished panelists, um, each working with different communities in Southwest Asia or Middle East. And together, we hope to explore ideas, approaches, and methods in anthropology beyond the conventional written texts we know of in academia, like articles and books. And with beyond the conventional written texts, we mean poetry, graphic novels, uh, comics, documentaries, and other visual approaches in this context. Following our discussion with the panelists, we will open the floor for audience questions using the Q&A function on Zoom. Now, I will introduce our wonderful panelists, whom I am a fan of, in alphabetical order of their surnames. Nehruz Abu Hatoum is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Concordia University. She served as the Ibrahim Abulugo Postdoctoral Fellow at Columbia University in 2018-19, and is a co-founding member of Insaniyat, Society of Palestinian Anthropologists, Currently, Dr. Abu Hatoum is working on her ethnographic project, The Art of Visual Politics, Tracing, Making, and Im Imagining Palestine, which examines the politics of visual arts production and its role in expanding Palestinian imagination. Lena Askari is an anthropologist, documentary filmmaker, and policy advisor, currently working as a research fellow at the Netherlands Scientific Council for Policy and is a part-time assistant professor in anthropology at the University of Amsterdam. Dr. Askari's uh, research looks at future imaginations, migration and youth in the Kurdistan region, and she has produced many short films such as uh, Bury Me Here, Bridge to Kobane, Future Factory and Harika Berka. Shirin Hamdi is a professor of anthropology at the University of California, Irvine. Before that, she was at Brown University actually. Her first book, Our Bodies Belong to God, was published by the University of California Press. Dr. Hamdi also works in visual media, particularly with comics. Uh, she is the co-author with Coleman Nye of Lisa, A Story of Friendship, Medical Promise, and Revolution. And Dr. Hamdi is also co-editor of the University of Toronto Press ethnographic series, of which Lisa was actually the debut graphic novel. And lastly, we have Leah Zeni. Uh, she's a, uh, they're a public anthropologist, author, and poet based in Auckland, California. Uh, they are the author of Strike Patterns, which came from Stanford University Press in 2022 and was the winner of the Independent Publisher Book Award Gold Prize for Creative Nonfiction. Dr. Zani um, is also the author of Bump Children, a monograph on ethnography and poetry. And two of the poems in Bomb Children won poetry prizes from the Society of Humanistic Anthropology. And from 2018 to 2021, they served as the poetry editor at Anthropology and Humanism. Thank you all for being here, for engaging with each other and with our, our audience. I think um, Shireen, ah, okay, Shireen is here too, perfect. Um, so we will proceed with uh, four questions. Okay. And I will, oh, sorry. Sorry. Shereen, could you mute yourself right now? Oh, okay. Um, I think Shereen is having some technical issues, but we will have her back hopefully. Um, so now we will proceed with four questions and I will call on speakers to respond in a randomized order. And for each question, each speaker will have about two, three minutes except for the third one, uh, which will require more time. And as a note here to our audience, it's natural for some uh, themes to overlap in this setting, but reiteration actually can be very helpful for a 
uh, workshop webinar like this. And without further ado, let's start with the first question. So um, I will ask Leah to answer this first and then we will go over with um, our speakers. So could you tell us how you came to be interested in these unconventional approaches? In other words, uh, could you share your trajectories and points of inspiration behind your approaches, methods beyond the you know, article book format? And we will begin with Leah. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Leah Zenni, and I'm delighted to be part of this webinar and workshop. Um, I am an anthropologist and a poet and an artist and a craftsperson. And these creative traditions have always been an important part of how I have practiced scholarship. Um, and as a as an anthropologist, I had initially kept these creative practices separated from my academic work um, and was then provoked by my own research into drawing on this larger toolkit. So initially I kept them separate and then I had realized that that was not serving my work and have been reintegrating them into my career. So I first, the moment in which I realized I needed to reintegrate these practices was on a preliminary research trip to Savannah Ket, which is an area of Laos that was massively bombed during the Vietnam American War. This is arguably one of the most bombed parts of our planet. The area had been completely destroyed by air warfare and was now being rebuilt slowly over many decades. And in trying to do field work in this area, I realized that there was an, uh, a kind of excess that I needed to figure out how to record. And that is when I started to turn to creative methods such as um, poetry or drawing. And I came up in particular with this method of field poetry, which is a practice of, of using poetry as field notes, um, either writing poems as notes or um, writing poetry out of field work material. So that's my one of my primary methods is this method of field poetry. Um, I think I will stop there since we're keeping our answers short and let you continue with the rest of the panelists. Perfect. Thank you, Leah. Nehruz, we can uh, move with you and then Lina and Shireen can comment. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, so uh, I have something written because it's just to keep um, everything a bit more organized. Um, so I'm joining here uh, from the unceded lands of the Ganegehaga Nation, who are the custodian of the lands and water of Jehoshagi, Montreal. I want to thank you, Fulia, and uh, my co-panelists for being generous and receptive to postponing this event twice due to the ongoing genocide in Gaza and the continuous calls for strikes in support of Gaza. Uh, I'm interested in Palestinian visual arts and artists uh, centering on the role of visual uh, art as an instrument for liberation and as a craft of insurgent, of political uh, insurgent um, against settler colonialism. Um, so I lived in Jerusalem between 2000 and 2004 and a period which engraved in my memory as it coincided with, the political, uh, with my political coming of age. And it was an era uh, of the Second Intifada, marked by constant military invasions and curfews in the West Bank and Jerusalem, and of course in Gaza. In 2002, uh, the Israeli army initiated the construction of the wall, known uh, to Palestinians as the Apartheid Wall. And over the ne approximately next years, the wall was erected throughout uh, different areas in the West Bank and Jerusalem leaving a lasting impact on, uh, on the population, on daily life, mobility, and so on. And what struck me the most about this structure was not only that it was a military concrete barrier dividing Palestinian cities and villages, serving, uh, severing connections between people and schools and hospitals and so on, but it was also a visual presence that disrupted the landscape or disturbed the landscape. 
it obscured sunset views, it obscured urban scenery, uh, transforming it into uh, an, an, an part of the Palestinian landscape. It almost became the Palestinian landscape, which actually people rejected and, and refused. And in my conversation with artists and uh, photographers, I discovered that the wall became this catal cat uh, catalyst for broader issues of representation uh, and imagination in Palestine. So for instance, our artist Yazan Khalili uh, insisted on not working with the wall and visualizing it by saying, you know, how can I resist the wall and the image of the wall altogether through my art? Others who sought to document the wall focused on its destruction, on the instance where it's being crossed and emphasizing on uh, defiance through climbing, breaking, uh, and so on of the wall, like the work of Khalid Jarrar. And I just want to share one image of one uh, work again that I'm inspired by, um, and I hope you can see it. Uh, one example stood uh, for me was Raida Saadi's photo essay series, which drawn from her performance uh, work, uh, and this one in specific going to school, but she had a series. The, the series uh, aimed at addressing the absurdity and cruelty of the wall in, uh, inside Palestinian urban spaces. And this image was widely actually circulated on Facebook, which this is an this is an art part of an art installation or a, a, a performance art. But this image then got picked up on Facebook, uh, and people shared it as Raida told me uh, as a real documentation of a real girl going to school. Um, so this the explora this exploration prompted me to engage with questions about how Palestinians represent their life, I'm going to stop it here, uh, and landscape, aiming to shift the focus away from the Israeli military structure. And throughout my research, I found confrontation, uh, uh, con I found confirmation of the argument that already exists, that indeed art in the Palestinian context serves as a grounding tool that brings community together and solidify a, con a collectivity, a sense of collectivity and fostering shared uh, sense of place and history and obviously identity. Today, I think um, visual representation in relationship to the genocide in Gaza, for example, uh, which is one of the most visualized and live streamed genocide. Uh, so I think about the representation of that. And I think while many Palestinians resisted the representational dichotomy, which placed them as either terrorists or victims of humanitarian crisis, after October 7, resisting this binary itself uh, becomes a more urgent, uh, ish, uh, urgent and partly because it aims at addressing the root cause of this destruction and ask us as Palestinians to think about, as and ask us to see and represent Palestinians as a people who are affirming their dignity and political aspiration. Thank you, Thank you Nehruz. Uh, we can continue with Lena. Hello everyone, very happy to be here. Um, and I'm already really inspired by the previous two speakers about what, what their initial thoughts were about, about using non-textual approach. And I think mine are coming from a very similar place, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll take you guys on a journey with me um, because for me, it really was ignited um, when I was doing my postgraduate studies in Cambridge University and I was doing short field work in um, Iraqi Kurdistan and um, I felt it was so important that what I was seeing there at the time, this was back in 2012, um, was so different from the images that people in the Western world had seen of the Middle East but also of Iraq, especially being one of maybe previous most mediaized countries in the world um, with images surrounding violence and 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 really horrible stuff um but always being shown from the perspective of a certain type of war um and i i wanted to counter that by showing different imagery showing everyday life and 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 i mean that um not to take away from the reality of war the reality of conflict the reality of their everyday um violence whatever that may be um, but as a as a way to show that that's not the only thing that's happening and we need to understand things in a different, more contextualized way, especially in the Western world when we aim to study what it, what it is that we want to study. So for me, 
it really came out of that period when I, I felt for the first time, I felt this is something that people need to see. Um, and I, I took a little camera with me when I was doing field work and I was interviewing people. I thought, wow, film is such an easy way to, um, to create kind of a, a different output for people to see because I, I wasn't sure people were, were going to read my work. Um, and I have to say, I, I felt like I failed because at the time I had no skills, no practical skills whatsoever in, in filming. So I, I was just, you know, aimlessly using the camera and, and the imagery was very bad. Um, but after that, I really, re I realized that, no, this is something that, you know, maybe I don't understand now, but I need more training. And so I continued on doing visual anthropology with, uh, a PhD degree and an, another MA degree um, at the University of Manchester, where there's a visual anthropology uh, center. And I think that's where I understood better that the things that I was intuitively thinking about actually had already been used and had been thought of by many number of people using, um, in this case for me, documentary, ethnographic documentary film, but also uh, photography and other, other multimodal ways of producing knowledge. And I think for me, that was kind of the the starting point, um, and and I've been building on that ever since. And I think it's still really important that we continue to show um, different imagery, but also understanding imagery and what that means for us. Um, trying to either think through our own backgrounds, our own histories, but also how exactly how technological affordances nowadays create such a different way of us getting knowledge and gaining knowledge, and and that's something that um, has really uh, stuck with me and also for the future of, uh, I'm a visual anthropologist, so I'm also thinking about how in the coming years are we going to understand this? Because at the time, 10 years ago, you know, everyone was talking about the Arab Spring or the Middle Eastern Revolution and, you know, social media is going to liberate us. And I think we live in a very different reality at the moment. So it is very important that we also think through these multimodal ways of living. Thank you, Anna. Shireen, can we continue with you? Yeah, thank you so much for this invitation. It's so nice to be back and part of a Brown event. Um, and I just wanna say how grateful I am for everybody's solidarity and flexibility when we were facing um, ongoing protests and, and uh, you know, trying to show solidarity with the Palestinian people during these horrific times. So it's nice to be in a group of people who refuse to act like it's normal when um, when there's so much mass violence. But I think that that segues really well to this question about, you know, what violence, like Nehru's was saying, we have so much visual representation of what's happening now. And, you know, part of the naivete of an anthropology or any kind of academic work is, you know, if only the world knew this could stop and the world does know. And so I think part of the um, challenge for us is to ask what kinds of images and how, and how do we curate them and what is the perspective? And so I'm a big fan of comics. So um, as you know, this was the book that um, we came out and it chronicled a bit of the uh, Egyptian Arab Spring. And part of what's really useful with comics is that there's never a pretense of an objective lens, right? There's always, you're always made aware that this is the hand of a person. And there's been a bit of a paradox with the increased um, uh, attraction of people towards comics and graphic novel with this kind of um, cynicism that any photorealistic image we see might have been doctored, it might have been photoshopped, it might be fake. Whereas um, with the drawing, it can only have been human made. And so there's a an intentionality behind that where you're coming to it, recognizing that there's already been the subjectivity and a lot of intentionality behind each image. And so that was part of the, um, but I love hearing your examples of other ways of having done that, like the that really beautiful image Nehru sh showed of the girl with the ladder, that that kind of emplacement is what we also tried to achieve. And the artists were, you know, two women who um, wanted to render this kind of everyday violence that people were 
oversaturated with, with images in the hand and from the perspective of young girls uh, living through this in Cairo. So that was a way to already in place the images. And the other way, um, and I think uh, Leah, you brought up just like how the field can change you, right? And demand different methodologies of you. And so in these moments um, during the Arab Spring, when the state, media channels were completely denying that there was anything happening. It was graffiti artists who were recording and who were writing the names and um, and picturing the faces of the martyrs. And so that was also a way of us to recognize, like to really broaden what academic citation means and to, um, you know, pay homage and give credit and and citation to the revolutionaries, including the graffiti artists who were doing this like really intense documentary work, but were also, um, you know, breaking through that kind of gaslighting that the state media was doing in terms of um, erasing what was happening, uh, bearing witness. And so thinking about how comics can help us bear witness, thinking about the work of Joe Sacco, for example, in Palestine and how um, really powerful that has been and, and endured over the years. Um, and I'm just gonna uh, just add one last detail about what comics does is is the panel to panel um, way that you narrate. And so people describe it as a kind of lean in medium where the reader is in the position to decide how much time to spend on each image. And it's up to the reader to make the connection between the panel that preceded and the panel that came after. And so it's asking for the reader's active involvement and in making sense of how each image um, connects to the one preceding and the next one. And so I think there's a lot of room um, uh, uh, for us to take on these other, and, and a lot of um, space for introducing and citing and bringing more people into the production of our works that's whether it's bearing testimony or trying to rethink different concepts of the region yeah thank you thank you everyone for already having us start with such powerful remarks so let's continue with the second question we have so how do you think engaging with and producing different kinds of media contribute to your work. So please share your reasons behind experimenting with these uh, multimodal approaches, methods. And we can start with uh, Lena this time. That's cool. Um, so I think this is a really great question um, coming from a visual anthropological approach. Um, I think what is really important, and it builds a little bit on what Shireen was saying as well, is that um, non-textual approaches, but also often in film, um, it's been made as if the researcher or the filmmaker is not part of the process, of the context of where you are. Um, and when we think about film often, you know, we, we, it's, it's magic, you know, we don't see the people behind it filming it or the people behind the camera or the lens um taking part of it and i think within visual anthropology there's you know a lot of thought going into not being the fly on the wall and understanding why it's important to include yourself as a filmmaker in that process and showing that uh gaining knowledge and, and information from others or from a context or a certain encounter is because you are there as well and i think translating this from um not just only theorizing about it, but also showing that in, in whether it's photography or in my case, documentary um, is really important. And maybe I can, if we have time, I can show you a little or a couple of imagery. Um, so I'm going to, can I share my screen? Yes. So I'm going to show you this imagery. Um, Um, nope. I think that works. Yeah. So when I started, this is back in 2014, um, and I started to make my first documentary film as part of a research. 
for my MA and I did what a lot of people do when they don't know what to film is that I filmed my own family. So these, this, these are my parents. At the time they were living in the Netherlands and then they moved back to Iraqi Kurdistan and I filmed them over a period of a year going through that process. Um, and I decided to also create, you know, make the film about larger uh, um, subjects of migration. Um, and this is an, still from some of our family archive uh, from back in the 90s of when we had just arrived. And it's really interesting because I think film can do that thing where you have different layers in one thing. So this is not only archival footage of my family, of them and their aspirations of coming to the West versus when they went back to the Middle East. But this is also this specific film was made by my parents on a, a, a recorder. Um, to show my family back in Iraqi Kurdistan how our lives were at the time. So it was already kind of a, a, you know, a filmic way of communicating to each other. And so I, I really wanted to include that in, in, in the film that I was making about my parents at the time. Um, and then just the last image of, you know, me including myself also in the film uh, through imagery and through voice that I am filming my parents, but you can hear me and you can see me. And I think it's important that as, as a filmmaker, but also as, as a researcher, that you're very honest about the things that you do. And you, you kind of break up that magic to, to allow for, for space to really rethink what does it mean when we talk about knowledge making? What does it mean when we do anthropological research? What does it mean when we're in proximity with other people? Um, so that's something that I, I want to share with everyone listening is that these are boundaries that you can cross and it's really important that you cross them and then then you can might contemplate about not crossing them anymore doing something experimental but it's important to think about the method of how you get to a research and using that in your multimodal uh, process. I'm going to stop. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Nee Rose. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Julia. And obviously, thank you, Lana and Leah and Shireen. I, I took a few notes. I mean, we will be talking about uh, similar topics, uh, clearly, like I, the whole idea of expanding the knowledge production that you talked about, uh, Lana, uh, through the visuals and, you know, the idea of um, uh, kind of creating one own methodology, like poetry writing in the field of field poetry. Uh, as a way to kind of make sense of what we're witnessing. And obviously um, the idea of witnessing and the idea of curation that Shirin, you talked about, and I'm gonna actually talk a little bit about that. I'm trying to experiment with this concept of curation as well. Uh, so my work, since it's focuses on Palestinian artists and uh, uh, to honor their work, I engage with the visual material that they create um, and incorporate it uh, as insight gained from, sorry, uh, the visual material that they create and the insight that I, that I learned through interviewing them <clears throat> as a theoretical uh, material. So like, for me, these images are continuation of, of theoretical frameworks. They're not just an addition to here is, here, is, here is how the wall looks like, or here is how the landscape, and here is an image. It's, uh, I'm trying to think about these images also as, uh, and particularly when we talk about artists, uh, conceptual artists, visual artists, they're very creative and theoretically um, really insightful. So this commitment leads me to carefully curate their work within my own and embodying some kind of a ethnographic or me embodying some kind of an ethnographic curation. And in this process, the ethnography itself serves as also an archival practice, tracing and documenting the transportation transformation of Palestinian art as a generation of inheritance. And I already see that through my interviews with artists where they all the time place themselves vis-a-vis. -vis, uh, I, I just wanna make sure that I'm talking about artists mainly in the West Bank. Uh, so they, they place themselves vis-a-vis -vis the older generation who used symbolism and nationalism in a more um, uh, overt way. And meanwhile, they're using it in a, in a more um, conceptual or abstract uh, so in a way, I invite my readers or the readers of my work to see my role as an ethnographic uh, curator of the artwork featured in my writings. And I encourage them to approach the collection of work with a curator's perspective, basically recognizing 
the deliberate and thoughtful selection of art and its strategic placement in conjunction with the text. And again, this goes back to Lana, what you said about um, the expanding the expanding the, the, the kind of epistemic field or field of knowledge production through visuals. Um, this approach aims to give the artwork um, its deserved visual and sensorial prominence while ensuring that my textual analysis doesn't really overshadow it. And uh, it's a balance that I believe is a delicate uh, balance and might uh, not always be you know, achieved, um, but it's something that I'm kind of aware of, of or uh, reflexive about. And again, like talking about anthropology and, and uh, reflexivity and positionality, this uh, also like uh, plays into this thinking. And finally, um, I only recently started experimenting with film. And I think about film as a rich way to document and, and represent Palestinian lives and conditions. But importantly, I want to think about this form not uh, as a visual proof of the text, but as a continuation of it. Um, and I think I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you, Nehruz. Uh, we can continue with um, Shireen. Yeah, thank you um, for the question. I think for me, uh, teaching graphic medicine or teaching graphic personal narratives in my medical anthropology class is really what brought it home for me that this is a very powerful medium because students were really responding to it. And there's so much that um, the comic medium can do. and especially because when you're dealing with pain or suffering or medicine, um, there's uh, experiences that defy words that that require, you know, that can't uh, be captured by words alone. And there's also a way that comics, I'm just going to um, share this image because uh, I teach it every year, including when I was at Brown, I would teach this film Fatini about a woman in Gaza um, with breast cancer. And you get this sense of how her fears of, uh, of living with breast cancer, but also um, just the everyday life of living in occupied Gaza is the feeling of strangulation. Uh, how do I unshare? Did I stop sharing? Is it still sharing? Um, stop? I think you I stopped. we could not see your screen oh, i think sorry sorry let me try again yeah uh, so that's yeah. The, the woman who's um you can see the the strangulation right and and when um you read ethnographies from people who are living in refugee camps they always talk about feeling suffocated and so um, that's an example where you get that image really powerfully and it's what's going on in her head, right? She's not actually being strangled by the state monster. So you can visualize the in interiority. And there's also something to comics that keeps it light because it's a genre that we associate with children's literature, we associate with the funny, but it doesn't sanitize. So it's more palatable than seeing photorealistic images of people living through really difficult um, situations, but it doesn't uh, sanitize or clear it or lessen the, the impact. And so that's been very powerful for my work. Thank you, Shireen. Let's continue with Nia. So I study the effects of explosive military waste and um, almost by necessity, just because of the size of the American military empire, much of my research focuses on American explosives and their global effects. And um, this is kind of an odd thing to study using creative methods. And I think that is also why it's important to use a diversity of methods. Um, but before I get into it a little more, I want to thank my colleagues who helped me understand those global effects in the Middle East in particular, such as Naima Mohammadi, Amal Bashara, the panelists, <laughs> and Atar Zia. And I want to mention Atar in particular because she is also a poet like me, who, and she does field work in Kashmir. And um, she has this wonderful way of describing her turn to poetry. Uh, where she describes ethnographic poetry as an as the result of an ethical surfeit 
um, of, of trying to witness beyond objectivity, which is not to say that you reject objectivity, but that objectivity is just one other way of looking at the world and that there are multiple ways to do it. So I'm just gonna very briefly read her description of this ethical surfeit, which is in her excellent book. Where is this? This is coming. Okay. Ethnographic poetry is a moment of surfeit as well as a catharsis of the excesses we as ethnographers have chosen to poke, dissect, and understand. The role of an ethnographer poet is akin to holding a wound, a wound that is simultaneously in the body of the other and reflected in yours. So let's just pause for a moment because that's a beautiful quote. <laughs> and then when I think about this idea, what is the excess that provokes me to these creative methods? And for me, some of the things included in that excess are emotions, unreliable memories, um, hidden histories or censored information, um, nonlinear time, ghost superstition, um, lineages of trauma and hope, personal bias. So it's a pretty mixed bag. And when I look at all of these things, one of the first thing I notice is that these are some of the most important parts of being human. Um, and one of the other things I notice or that I that pulls me as a scholar is how do I get at this excess in, in the interests of my ethnography? And so, and I think this is where, as Lana pointed out, these methods become epistemological necessities. Um, and for me, I think about ethnographic holism in the way that it's being kind of renegotiated for our modern discipline, um, because we're no longer interested in the kind of imperial top-down holism of the past, and yet we do want to authentically represent um, a, a, a human experience. Um, so I've been particularly inspired by Simpson's idea of ethnographic refusal, um, by Jackson's idea about thin description in addition to thick description and the way that you can decide strategically about the, the sort of thickness of the description that you're conveying. And then in my own work personally, I also turn to these ethnographic, these like creative ethnographic methods, which give me an incredible breadth of choices that I can make about how I'm orienting myself in the field. And this leads me into my next idea, which is for me, I am, I'm drawn to poetry because it's a way of um, retraining my senses. Um, and I'm thinking here about Bourdieu's idea of disposition in the field. And I think that creative methods and poetry for me is a way to cultivate a specific disposition. Um, it feels to me like poetry and ethnography are very similar ways of engaging with the world. They're mutually enriching and reinforcing. Um, and this, um, I think Nehruz was talking about the these methods being sort of extensions and theoretical frames. And so for me personally, one of the ways in which these two things reinforce each other is in my theory of parallelism, which was the cornerstone of my first book. Uh, parallelism briefly is, is the idea that um, multiple things can be held simultaneously in a kind of parallel tension without resolving in, within a, a culture. And I was specifically looking at war, the aftermath of war and explosive military waste and like current peace. And these two things can exist side by side without resolving. Um, but this theory was inspired firstly by a Lao poetic tradition called poetic parallelism, where Lao poets will write poems in two parallel columns, which never resolve themselves. They are held in this beautiful tension. And it was through my own learning how to read and speak Lao and talking to poets in Laos that I started to think about this idea of parallelism and started to write my own poetry in this style and then ultimately led to this theory that was the cornerstone of my first book. So that's just one example of how these things are mutually enriching.
Thank you. Thank you. This is really wonderful. Again, very powerful uh, remarks, very powerful answers. Um, so our, our, our third question is the one that will maybe take a bit longer to answer, but I will still ask you to try to limit it to maybe six, seven minutes, just to make sure we have some room for Q and A. Um, so could you please provide some examples from your creative work and tell us about how such approaches, methods facilitate or complicate knowledge production? You all have already been doing this uh, throughout this conversation, um, but maybe more uh, detailed examples, maybe some things that you want to talk more about. And we can start with Shireen this time. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna borrow from Scott McLeod just because we're um, we're not used to reading about these kinds of things. I think in in our fields, but uh, Scott McLeod is a comic artist and a theorist of how comics work, and his argument it's I find it so interesting. So he says that the more you strip down a face the less details and photorealism that you provide someone with a face or just um, like a circle with two dots, we can't not see that as a head. And his argument is that the more simplified it is, the more we relate to it as a person, as, as ourselves, like we project our self onto that. And so he says, if you're like, your eyes will, just naturally go to the simplistic image. Um, and he, the theory of, of why that's the case is he said he thinks that when you're looking at somebody, you're picturing a kind of you're seeing them in all of their detail, but you're also seeing, you're also imagining what yourself looks like, but you can't think of yourself in all of that detail. Like this Zoom stuff where we see ourselves in all this detail is like so weird, right? But like if, if we were not on Zoom, we would just have this very um, stripped down image of what we think. And so that's why our idea of ourself is this stripped down. And when we see a stripped down image, we project ourselves onto it. And so different anthropologists, Benjamin Dix, my colleague who's in the UK, he has um an organization called positivenegatives.org have really taken up this idea of trying to simplify. And so they're using comics for human rights awareness. And he says that these are images that he took from his fieldwork in Sri Lanka among the Tamil people. And they were going through a civil war right on the heels of a really devastating tsunami. And so people um, were devastated and displaced. And and this is just an image where I could, you know, ask people, do your eyes in fact go to the simplified one? And um, and usually in my classes, they say yes. I mean, we're interested in the details, but we spend a bit more time on the stripped down. And so that's just been so interesting for me to think through in terms of anthropology. Sometimes we really don't want to get all of the details let, right, but what does it mean to get all the details right if people feel overwhelmed by them? and don't relate on an empathic level. So that's one. And then the other um, example is this idea of psychic inter interiority, which I brought up also with the Palestinian example of the woman feeling um, suffocated and choked. Here's a page from, um, from Lissa, the book I worked on, where there's an argument between the two protagonists and Layla saying, here we, have an we don't have enough medicine, there you have too much. We're fighting every day just to get treatments for what we have now, let alone worry about what we might get in the future. Today's a gift from God. And then Anna, the North American character says, um, when Layla challenges her, why try to treat a disease you don't have? She says, but I do have it. I've lived with it my whole life. But when she's saying that, we see the image of her mother, not her. And that was a really powerful way for us to um, show what we wanted to, which is about the multiplicity of the self, how the self is um, completely embedded in social relations. And so the haunting of her mother's life and her mother's premature death is really what's prompting Anna's whole decision making and her sense of self. And so it's just a really quick visual and very visceral way to get at that very wordy thing that I just said, if I were, if I only had to rely on words. Um, and then I, I guess the third thing I would say is the symbolism that we get to 
um, use. And so like the, the snaky um, character choking Fatine in that earlier um, uh, scene that I showed. And in this one, it's really simple. Anna and her mother, um, the character they're talking about histories of repression of cancer and how some memories are brought to light and some aren't. And they happen to be in a dark room um, processing photographs when they have this conversation. And so the artists here use the light and the dark on the gray to enhance that message of what is hidden and what is kept in the dark, what's kept in the dark and what is brought to light. And so this I really think happens on a subconscious level where you um, you get another kind of resonance of the message and you don't consciously realize, oh, you know, some things are revealed and unrevealed just like light, but but it um, it gives another kind of like ping to, to the reading of comics. And I think that's why they've been really successful in the classroom. So those are just some examples. Thank you, Shireen. This was an amazing start. So we can continue with Leah. Uh, so this is the examples question, yes? Okay. Um, thank you, Shireen, that was beautiful. I loved seeing all of that. Um, okay, so I'm here to give some examples of creative literary methods. And I would like to share a field poem that I put in my, my latest book, Great Friends. Um, and again, field, field poems as I'm, using them are ethnographic notes written as poems or poems that are written out of ethnographic material. And I use these in both of my previous books, Bond Children and Strike Patterns. Um, in Bond Children, they're used as, um, Bond Children is more of a scholarly book. So they're, they're used more explicitly as like ethnographic material. Whereas in this one, which is creative nonfiction, they're woven into the text itself. So a reader reading this, this particular section might not even realize that they're reading a poem. It's, but it, but it, it, I think it will be obvious once I read this out loud that it is. Um, so this is the, in the middle of the book and it, which is at a point where the, the characters are starting to move deeper into the, these, um, these areas that are contaminated with explosive military waste left over from the war. And the reader is also, I hope by this point in the book, realizing that they are in a very dangerous place and they hadn't perhaps realized that earlier in the book. Um, and I'm trying now in this section to connect those experiences of living in these old battlefields in Laos to these, these larger global networks of American militarism. And that's what this section is about. <laughs> if a person is working in a factory that produces cluster bomblets, and if there is a malfunction with the fuse or the cooling explosive as it drips into its case, or if the warm oil soaks into the person's skin and their clothing, and if they take a smoke in the slick heat of a parking lot in a Kansas summer, then the spark of their lighter might light them up. If a person is kneading a white fistful of C4 explosive clay for a controlled demolition, and if there is a thunderstorm charging the air with invisible sparks, one of those sparks could ignite the explosive. I have heard of a Lao technician who ate C4 as a ritual for power, like moonshine steeped with scorpions, and for a time I imagine that person was a fuse. If a person is using nitroglycerin patches for chest pain, and if they have a heart attack, and if the emergency responder places paddles on their chest without first checking for and removing the patches. If a person carries a bomb on their person, keeping the trigger in their coat pocket or giving it to a friend, and if they go to the American embassy and press that trigger. If a person is being cremated and if the attendants do not check for and remove any medical devices like pacemakers. 
If a person's home is bombed and if fragments of the explosives lodge in their body and if they make it to the Baghdad hospital and if the surgeon on duty does not properly account for the fragments. In army guidelines revised for the Middle East wars, the American military recommends sacrificing these potentially explosive patients for the sake of preserving the surgical facility and team. If these fragments are not properly removed, even if they are inert, they will continue to slice through the person's body for years after the blast, extending the explosion caught in their inexorable trajectories. Wow. So that is an example of one of my ethnographic poems. And there are a couple of things that I want to, because we're in an academic setting, there are a couple of things I want to draw out here. Um, one is that is to remind everybody that ethnography is both a method and a genre. And for me, it's a genre of writing. Um, and I think that it, with an example like the one I just read, it, it becomes easier to see that there is a relationship between our methods and how we write ethnography. Um, and one of the other things I want to draw out is that creative methods help us understand more of the human experience, back to this idea of ethnographic holism, but not in a naive way where we just want to capture everything. We need to be strategic and ethical about how we do that. Um, so I think maybe the important part is that ethnographic methods help us to understand more of the human experience in a way that is relevant to our research and ethical projects. Um, and then more on a more sort of basic level, I think these creative methods help us produce more creative ethnographic writing, um, which is, as Shireen was pointing out, like the way that we represent our work changes its mobility in the world and the impact that it has. Um, I wanted to end by pairing that reading with um, a, a tiny bit of my own personal history. So um, I, I was raised in a very religiously diverse household. I went to psychic school at the Berkeley Psychic Institute when I was a kid. Um, and there were, we had a family shaman. It was very strange. Um, and dur during this complex period, my, my dad was also a Zen monk at a monastery for much of my childhood. And it was from my father that I learned more about the American Zen tradition um, and also about the American um, fight against the Vietnam War. And I'm thinking here in particular about Thich Nhat Hanh, a Vietnamese monk who came to the United States as an exile from the Vietnam War and then was one of the major founders of the American Zen tradition. He's also the founder of the Engaged Buddhist Movement and Nhat Han died in 2022 at his temple in Vietnam, where he had returned after nearly 40 years of exile. And I'm returning to this, this man and his work and the memories it brings up of my own childhood in order to share this amazing quote with you from Nhat Han. And here's the quote. If you are a poet, you will see clearly that there is a cloud floating in this sheet of paper. Without a cloud, there will be no water. Without water, the trees cannot grow. And without trees, you cannot make paper. So the cloud is in here. The existence of this page is dependent upon the existence of a cloud. Paper and cloud are so close. I think that multimodal creative ethnographic methods help us see the cloud in a page of ethnographic writing. <laughs> that was so beautiful, Thea, thank you. Um, we can continue with Nehru's and then with Lana. Yeah, thank you, Leah. It's hard to follow up after this. Um, I also think, I mean, I first of all, Arthur Zia's book is one of my favorite ethnographies and I uh, it's like my fourth year or third year teaching it. Um, and uh, I do think that some of these books that you mentioned, like uh, Simpson and Arthur Zia and 
they are not only a book about a topic, about Kashmir, about resistance, about the disappearance, but they're actually very methodologically dense. So I think like um, uh, we, we should also read them as, 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 uh, as, as books that expand our understanding of knowledge production and of methodology. Um, so yeah, in the spirit of poetics, I, I want to move to my example, and it's really still a work in progress that I managed to finally, like, you know, experiment with. Um, <clears throat> so this excerpt that I will show you is from a work in progress, and this uh, specific uh, uh, segment is from uh, Bethlehem region uh, in Palestine, and it was filmed by um, by like a bunch of collaborators. So I have a um, Afif Amiri helped in the filming, and uh, my friend Samar Hasboon, who is a photographer and an artist, she volunteered to kind of like perform for me for this film, and it's and it's very much like a performance, and like it's experimental and it's performative. Um, and a filmmaker and my student Shahab Mehandus helped with the editing. Uh, so it's an experimental ethnographic short film uh, that engages with the history of lost Palestinian arch uh, art archive, showing how, despite the damage and loss endured by the, uh, the despite the damage uh, endured by this loss, the energy of inspiration drawn from the land and water continue to fuel creation uh, of of more art. And I'm here speaking about. Uh, you know, a, a long history of lost, looted, destroyed Palestinian art or Palestinian archive, film, uh, you know, and so on. The thread of lost and fragmentation that weaves through a uh, Palestinian experience on, on a grand scale of refugeeness, of displacement, of ethnic cleansing, of destruction, also mirrored in the faith of Palestinian art. So, however, even in the face of such adversity, Palestinian managed to breathe life and narrative and narratives into their existence through both lived experience and their visual and conceptual artistic expressions. So I came across this specific case of the lost Palestinian art archive through a text that I read actually published in the Palestinian uh, journal, Journal of Palestine Studies in Arabic by uh, art critic and researcher Rana Hanani, uh, whom I also interviewed for this film. And I'm, uh, I don't have a sound yet, and I'm not sure how to, you know, should I have a voiceover? Should I only have text? I'm still experimenting and thinking about, and also recorded sounds myself. I don't know, maybe I should incorporate these sounds uh, 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 parallel, you know, not uh, kind of in uh, parallel, as you said, Leah, to, to the image. So, but they are not, they are not, um, uh, uh, there, there might be there might be a discrepancy basically uh, and to maybe play with also that uh, I'm gonna share my screen um, and again there's no sound and I will just probably be speaking over um, so I hope you can see it so this film um, Uh, so this film raises central questions about how one can respond to the loss and destruction of Palestinian archive. Uh, can attending to the generative voice of the land, water and sky that captivate the inspiration of art in Palestine counter this looming loss? And should we write or represent against this narrative of loss? And here I'm gesturing to Eve Tuck, you know, against the damaged narrative and some artists who lost their original work chose to, reprodu to reproduce an interpretation of what was lost. And the memory of these recreated works themselves, along with the stories accompanying this recreation, become also an additional element of the Palestinian layer, narrative layer, contributing to the evolving uh, archive of Palestinian art that refuses to be destroyed and lost. And in this work, I don't simply replace what is lost, I can't, but I engage with the element that inspired Palestinian artists to create. Um, these elements are intricate part of Palestinian livelihood, like water, land, soil, trees, and it's building on many testimonies of artists, how they engage with the landscape, with the figure of the woman, with water, with land. And this visual work uh, and the performance element of it, here by Samar Hasboon, is attempting to work within this imaginative power. 
while we might not have a full documentation of the loss, we might have an imaginative power to reanimate archival provocation uh, or its archival provocation. And this specific uh, scene is from uh, Hussana village in Bethlehem area, which have seen recently a lot of invasion by the Israeli army, but also uh, this pool, this specific natural pool, which is some of the very limited natural resources left for Palestinians in the West Bank. Uh, actually, when we went to film, they were settlers and we had to kind of kick them or tell them that we need the pool. Um, um, and here I'm using this, for example, fabric, the white fabric, because of to gesture to the use of white fabric in many of the Palestinian artists' uh, work in the period that well, that we talk about 70s and 80s and 90s, where a lot of this their art was lost, like Tamam uh, Al-Akhal or Ismail Shamut used this image of. Uh, and I'm happy to talk to you more about this uh, this scene. And I have other scenes about in the olive grove and in the desert. Um, in addition to the interview with uh, Rana Hanami. Thank you. I will, I hope I stopped sharing. Thank you so much, Neiruz, yes. Um, this was wonderful. We are very excited about how this project will unfold further. Um, and we can continue finally for this question with Lana. Yes, thank you. Well, yeah, I'm, I have to say I'm, I'm getting very inspired by all the different works I'm seeing now. So that's, that's also a really great uh, exchange of things. Um, I think what I'll do is for this question, I'll tell you a little bit more about ethnographic documentary film, and then the t things that I've tried to explore in um, one film that I made during my PhD. And then I'll show you a clip of, of, of that film as well. Um, so before I, I talked a little bit already by, you know, exploring different types of methods in, in documentary filmmaking um, and ethnographic documentary film has, has very much been focused on observation, the observational method. Um, as in ethnography, you know, you you follow your your the characters or the themes that you're you're interested in. Um, you use a handheld camera most of uh, most of the time. You know, you follow people in their daily lives. Um, and and what I think is also really important um, that I think sets us apart from maybe um, different types of production. So if we look at maybe more artistic production or um, journalistic production, and not necessarily, but just as a discipline. Um, I think for us in anthropology or using ethnographic methods, you know, you you research over longer periods of time, which also means that you you get to enhance or at least look at it through a different angle because you're, you know, you really try to draw out the the, the changing self perception of people or the changing of whatever that is happening in, in a certain area where you're filming. And I, I think this is also very important because most of us also, we return to the field, you know, you, you spend years and decades on, on the same place or the same people. And I, I really want to um, I draw out that as well as something that is actually lends itself really well for non-textual methodology. And, um, and in my case, documentary film, you know, in all of these things that we're doing, like is said before, it's used as both a method to gain and elicit information during field work or maybe even your writing process, as was said. Um, so also in the final product, it, it's, it translates certain information maybe better and can be understood better by others um, because of sensorial ways and audiovisual ways and how we, we process uh, information. Um, and I, I personally think that in that way, film or audiovisual production can capture so much more complexity and layers of, of social knowledge and, and the human experience that can be communicated to the viewer. And, and also, you know, we try to think through what we produce, but then also what people see as the viewer, you know, this can change from person to person. I think that's actually really beautiful because that's where you get 
really interesting um, conversations about how that how that is shared. Um, so moving on to my my example, um, I'm going to share my screen again. I think you can all see the image, am I right? Yeah, perfect. So um, during my PhD research a few years back, I looked at how people in Iraqi Kurdistan maintain hope during times of uncertainty and times of crisis and how that also impacted their, um, their future plans and what kind of decisions they would make. And one of the films that I made um, is called Bridge to Kobani. And this is about a Syrian Kurdish uh, journalist and, and refugee at the time in Iraqi Kurdistan. And, and we see him here, this is Mohammed. Um, you see him here at work. So Mohammed is a journalist from the city of, of Kobani, which um, as many of you might remember back in 2015 was kind of the stronghold of, of the Kurdish resistance against the, the um, against ISIS. Um, and they, they held a really long fight at the time. And he left Syria, he fled Syria and Kobani around 2014, just before that time, lost many family members, unfortunately, and his, his home in Kobani was also destroyed. Um, and so he was living in a, a refugee camp in Iraqi Kurdistan, and here you can see him also working for an NGO inside the refugee camp. Um, and here's processing some registration food stamps. Um, but what was interesting about this film is that I met Mohammed because I was doing field research with this NGO and, and he told me a story and he was, because he was a journalist, he was also really interested in the topics that I was working on. And um, when I said, you know, I want to make a film as well, he he basically was like, oh, maybe we should make a film about me. And, and I followed. Um, and I think that was a very interesting choice because in that case, the film became a really collaborative effort right? Um, discussing with Mohammed, you know, what should we film? What should we shoot? What is important to you? Uh, how do you see your future? And, and what kind of decisions do you want to make? And it started off with filming his daily life and the things he would do, but also in preparation of him maybe um, going to back to Syria. That was his dream. But as other days, he would also feel really, you know, worn down about the situation in Kovan and he would actually want to leave and, and come to Europe. Um, and I think this is also something that has been theorized a lot is that, you know, the use of montage or the use of film has been discussed really as a powerful tool in dealing with, um, you know, capturing invisibilities, dreams, future, the past, the continuous changing of self-perception and self-becoming. And I think, you know, when when obviously also, you know, using text or, or imagery or, or graphic novels, you know, there's the limits does not exist you can you can create and with documentary film there are a couple of more limits to it um but trying to juxtapose those changing realities in my film um over a period of time i think um that's how i at least try to draw out um those frictions um and so now i'm going to move on to the part the clip um it's the final scene of the film because so at the time we were filming in Iraqi Kurdistan and 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 he really wanted to go to Syria um and in the time that I was there uh, we didn't manage to go there because of safety security issues um and then when he went himself back in 2019 um you know this is image of me filming in the camp this is Muhammad again um he I asked him, you know, would you would you want to film something yourself, maybe to end off with, and and this is what he made. So I'm just going to share with you guys what he thought was important. Um, it's about three minutes. Slow, Russian. Do I just saw the captain of Kobane, director Garao Mboshari, Faman Bo Kobane, Bo Kurdistan, Rojava. حسکی زور خوشه دوای او دور کوتنه دوای او او شر قرصه کل کوبنی بو چرا کی تر گرام اما شپای کری آرین میرکانه که کچک او خوی لکشری کوبنی دا لو دستانه کوبنی دا خوی بو قربانی شروان بو بلام لو شر دا قربانی کی زور مانده 
استاش کاری که تر آوار لیکوبانین، ام پای کرال. Something went wrong, and my PowerPoint has decided to stop. Okay, well, in that case, let me just finish off. Uh, I don't know how we're doing for time. I'm looking at you, Fui. I think um, maybe I'll take a few. Uh... I think we have a bit more time, so if you want to okay. pull that up I don't again. Know. Yeah, I'm trying to see what happened because it said uh, PowerPoint uh, is just stopping. Oh, I interject to say, Lena, I would love for you to explain this image. Yeah. <laughs> what are we looking at? That's amazing. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Oko, you're seeing my... Yeah. <laughs> you're seeing my screen now. Okay, I have stopped. Um, very quickly, this is an, that was an image of um, back from 1991, Kurdish resistance fighters in Turkey. And it's actually Kurds from Iraqi Kurdistan who fled to Turkey at the time. Um, so it's um, Iraqi Kurdish Peshmerga fighters, so the guerrilla fighters at the time from the Iraqi parts who were in Turkey to um, seek safety from the, the Ba'ath regime. Um, and it's very common, obviously, in the Middle East to hang up carpets. Um, but, you know, it's very interesting in, in the image you see an imagery of Jesus, but also um, of the rock and roll star. <laughs> and I think it just points out to you know, the photographer at the time probably found it really comical, but I think it also points out to people maybe not understanding at all that all these things in the world can happen in the same place at the same time. And that's what I think is beautiful about it. But enough about the picture and the imagery. Um, I wanted to go back to what I just showed you about what Muhammad filmed uh, back in his hometown. And I think it's really important that, so at the time when I was doing my PhD, Many things were happening, of course, in the Middle East, but in the in, in the Kurdish in the Kurdistan region, um, in as well as in Syria, as Iraq, as in Turkey, as in Iran, um, there was so much happening that kind of from that fight in Kobani against ISIS, also the Kurdish identity kind of changed, and a lot more solidarity was created between different uh, Kurdish groups, uh, whether they're different politically or from different from different parts and different countries. And I think Muhammad really, um, you know, he really lived that before he was not so interested in that. And I think through those experiences, uh, but also through migrating and going back, he, he really found it much more important. And I think it was really interesting to see throughout the years of filming together um, how that changed. And that that's why also he found it really important to go back and just to end on another note, um, you know, you never know how things will go. Um, Muhammad left Syria again um, because the situation is still not safe. Um, and last year he actually um, ended up taking the Mediterranean route to Europe. And fortunately, fortunately, he made it and he's now in Germany and he's waiting family reunification. Um, but we've started filming again. And what I want to end up with is saying, you know, um, these type of research projects, for me, they don't end. They they continue because the, the story doesn't end. And I think it's really important that as researchers, we, we keep an eye to that. Thank you, Lana. I think that was a final remark for this question that it does not really end there. Thank you. Um, so our final question today, and in the meantime, our audience can maybe start asking their questions through using the Q&A function on Zoom. I'm seeing some already have done so. So our last question is, do you have any suggestions for people who would like to experiment with such methods like yours or uh, different approaches, creative approaches, and how can they, how can they um, start using or uh, how can they improve themselves in using these methods and approaches? And uh, we can begin with Nehru's. Thank you, Fulia. And uh, yeah, there's a lot to to talk about about these images and uh, um, narratives and stories that that we heard. Um, I think we have probably already suggested some some uh, suggestions. Um, how to approach the, the, the visual or other methodologies. Uh, but maybe I can start with um, 
uh, this idea that I, I it just came up to my mind when I was uh, listening to an interview with Tina Kant, uh, and she said that she encourages her student to think counterintuitively. And so what does it mean to listen to images, which is uh, later, of course, her work uh, um, and her book uh, that uh, took up this question, what does it mean to listen to images? You know, we see images, we watch images, we don't listen to them, but what happens if we ask this question? So I think maybe one thing is to kind of think about that counterintuitive uh, uh, question that is counterintuitive and how, and I think it opens up exactly like the field of knowledge production and it opens up um, uh, uh, thinking about, you know, methodology in, in, uh, in, in different uh, different way. Uh, I think most importantly, um, I want uh, for people who want to experiment with a visual is to be aware of the visual politics of such representation, which already we touched on a little bit. Uh, most importantly, images do not speak for themselves and by themselves. I think it's a myth that uh, images worth thousand words. Uh, they need framing, and we are and we are learning this issue of framing from you know the horror images that we're watching from Gaza and, and other images uh, throughout the Middle East. We we need framing, and it's not enough to just represent something to understand and um, uh, and to tell to tell a narrative of that uh, uh, what we are showing. I think the framing is important. I also think. Um, uh, that working with artists, at least in my case and in others, you know, collaborating, as uh, Lana mentioned, uh, should emerge through an ethics of care. And there is a responsibility for us, especially like if we are in academy and we, you know, we have, we have positions and funding and all that is also responsibility and holding uh, uh, these relations through ethics of care. Like in my case, and of course, like, um, you know, I'm trying to say it in a humble way, obviously, um, you know, trying to think about like, in my case, for example, I, I gave Summer the liberty to just experiment with her performative uh, skills and also the filmmaker, uh, the, the camera person, um, Afif, I also, you know, we were both kind of thinking about different angles of how to film and all that. And, and um, while I was recording at the same time that scene, so uh, everything was collaborative. Like we all the time talked about, you know, the next scene, the next uh, angle, and there was a lot of patience also involved. Uh, so, so that one thing, and also a responsibility for us who deal with images and visuals and people's voices, even a narrative, is to um, uh, also um, to know that we we also are engaging in archival practices. We are documenting, like these moments in history and time. So in a sense, uh, uh, to also be aware of this archival uh, uh, practice that we are engaged with, which should be, you know, um, which should be um, taken seriously and, and, and engage with, you know, again, ethics of care. Of care. Um, so this is, I think, maybe the two main suggestions is counterintuitive thinking and, uh, uh, the politics of representation and careful, you know, tethering between text and image in a way that, you know, um, help, does not strip these images from its politics or its power. And I think maybe one of the questions uh, is, is around that. And the idea of thinking about ourselves also in relationship to, we are documenting, we are archiving, and we need to take care of this archive that we're building of our stories and uh, other people's stories as they tell us and as we witness, which something also was mentioned uh, before. Thank you, Nehruz. We can continue with Lana. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's really good, the, the framing part. That's why, why we're here. Um, I want to say maybe a bit more on the practical side, um, just to add a different uh, layer to it. Um, the way I learned was just by practicing. So, you know, whether that's if you want to write poems, you want to draw, you want to make films, you want to do photography, uh, you want to do soundscapes, just start practicing now, I think. Um, even if you're not, if you feel you're not successful, I think, you know, we touched upon it earlier as well. It's part of your thought process of the, 
the final thing that you're going to make and and that's really important and there's beauty in that so you know draw what you find interesting um i'm also a firm believer in in spreading your skills you know i also use drawing during my field notes um imagery to help me inspire you know it's you know sometimes we would have um small like uh half an hour kind of uh, draw your field work kind of uh um tests where we would sit together with other academics just to kind of think through your own field work in a different way so i think there's so much creativity to that and if you want to also go further then you can you can perfect your skill by um, enrolling in a course or doing a degree so for ethnographic filmmaking in my case specifically there's really good programs uh, graduate programs in at the university of manchester the granada center for visual anthropology um, there's one in Goldsmiths in uh, London. In the Netherlands, we have an MA, pro uh, MA uh, program uh, at the University of Amsterdam, also at Leiden University. Um, I think there's some in Denmark as well, obviously in the US, uh, why you might be more familiar with those. Um, so there's more and more places where I think also in, in the graduate programs and even in, in our bachelor programs, um, students can pick like a, a course in visual anthropology to kind of explore those things you know what does it mean to create a film project what does it mean to interact with your um the people that you do research with in a different way um and um i think in the end also what is for me always important um and i can really feel it with the others as well hopefully i'm, I'm not mistaken um i think it's always important to ask yourself you know why are you the person to make this and that project and why why now and I think that really helps setting as well, like the, the tone of your work um, and and trying to think through that is is also really important. But I would say, you know, get creative. It's 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 really liberating. Thank you, Nana. Shirin? Yeah, it's so nice to be in this um in this setting where people are telling you to be creative. So what I was gonna talk about how uphill um getting into this is and and unfortunately we don't mostly have lenas as our professors and our gatekeepers telling us to be creative we're told to not do that and a lot of the training and so i think it's kind of reviving or unlearning what you've learned a lot of times in grad school the uphill battle and turning to these types of creative methods involve so many things. So first is that these types of um, creative outlets are a lot of times marginalized in the academy. They're not taken as seriously. We're still having a lot of debates about whether they count as credit for academic promotion and all of these kinds of things. And those are just, those are real um, structural constraints. The other thing like we've heard from Nehru's and Lena, everybody is that collaboration is so important when you get involved in these types of visual making, other forms, and, and we're working against the academic myth of the solo author, right? The lone cowboy goes out in the field and does everything on their own and gets the credit on their own. And so that's another real big disincentive that I think we have to take seriously. Um, and the other, aside from, you know, war and displacement, you know, destroying archives, destroying humanity, Art can do so much in restoring that humanity and trying to bring somebody back at, um, in in a way that you know provokes emotive responses in the viewer and provokes a different type of relationship than pure victim or you know mortality statistic or fear of a potential terrorist. It so it is so so important to do this. I think we all agree on that, but I think also taking um, seriously. The challenges and the disincentives. So another one, aside from you know war and <laughs> academic disincentive, is now corporatization. And these types of creative projects take a lot of time. They're very time intensive, especially you know drawing panel to panel, and um, and time translates into cost. And so there's also the corporatization of academic publishing, the corporatization of the university that's always trying to think of how to scale up. And I think we actually have to take seriously the the real threat of AI more and more um, because as people are getting, you know, realizing that students maybe don't have the same attention span for reading long form and <laughs> they're used to a lot of visual images and incorporating those in our teaching, there's also been a shift in academic publishing and 
I mean, I won't say names, but there there were <laughs> recently an academic publisher who was doing a whole presentation on how AI could facilitate, you could do computer generated images for each of these texts and wouldn't that appeal to larger audiences? And wow, like what's the point? Like we just talked about, you know, trying to work against the dehumanization of people because of politics and war, but there's that other kind of dehumanization, which is getting to the bottom line and trying to replace humans with um, algorithms and computers. So just to say that we have to take those all very seriously, know what we're getting into and collectively have a voice and talk amongst each other more and kind of come up with a collective voice that tries to um, meet these challenges so that we can pave the way for others. Thank you, Shireen. Leah? Uh, when I teach workshops, one of the most common questions I get is, okay, Leah, you're doing all this great stuff, but you're studying bombs <laughs> and battlefields. How do we apply this to boring topics? And um, I really do understand the, 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 the sort of judgment of that question. Um, but I think one of the great lessons of poetry in particular is that people can be at their edges or at the extremes without having to go to a physical extreme or experience a, a crisis. And um, so if you are among the people who has that same concern, I would tell you that these same methods are absolutely like I have explored a particular extreme of the human experience, but we are surrounded by those extremes every day, even in very normal run of the mill settings. So um, you can always explore your own inner edges and you can always explore the, these like different or slightly hidden aspects of the human experience, which are everywhere and in everything all the time. So as an example of that, another ethnographic poet whose work I admire is Misha Kenton Taylor, and she applies these same kinds of literary methods to ESL classrooms. And her poems are beautiful and amazing and have incredible depth. Um, so go check out her work if you want to see an example of how this method is applied in a more like conventional setting. I also want to recommend a recent project of mine it's a book called An Ethnographic Inventory, and it is edited by Tomas Sanchez Criado and Adolfo Estelella. And it's an edited volume of um, creative or unusual ethnographic methods. They're calling it an ethnographer's toolkit. And I have a chapter in there on field poetry, and there are chapters on all sorts of just like fascinating, interesting methods. So if you want to just kind of think try to like get an idea of like how different people are using these in their work in a very accessible way, that book is great, an ethnographic inventory. Um, and of course, I would also love it if you read my two books. <laughs> so you could see how I'm applying these methods in my work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leah. Yeah, these were amazing suggestions, both more idea abstract level and thinking about the ethical aspects of what we're doing and practical aspects of how we can do what we do. Thank you, everyone. We are so, so lucky to hear about your experiences. And um, I personally learned uh, so much uh, from you, from your very powerful, incredibly important work. Now, uh, as we open the floor to audience, please um, share your questions through the Q&A function. And I'm already seeing um, many questions actually, and I'm seeing one particular commonality between maybe three, four questions is um, the question of how can people experiment with these more uh, non-conventional, unconventional methods, approaches when they have limitations, like for example, writing a dissertation and, you know, within certain constraints. So how can they still benefit from such methods? If any of you have any comments about this, please jump in because this was a general question asked to everyone. Ooh, 
tough one. <laughs> like, trying to say something. Um, so I, I was looking at the questions as well, and I think something that's returning is that um, how to implement this when you're in a system um, that does not appreciate it or is not familiar with it. And I think that was also what Shireen was pointing out to. Um, so I think it's really important to find a community that does appreciate and does talk about it. So in my case, I, I, I went to a department where it is very much appreciate, appreciated and necessary and evaluated as academic work. Um, and through that, I, I found kind of the community um, that works on visual anthropology in that way. Um, which created space for me. But I also know of a friend of mine who was doing the PhD at the same time in a different university. Um, and she really wanted to make a film and, and they didn't really appreciate it. They also didn't find it part of her, her thesis. So she still had to write a full length thesis and next to that make the film. Um, and again, collaboration. She found people that found her topic interesting, other types of researchers, filmmakers, and 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 she created the film and actually also came to my department and different places to screen it, to show it, and to discuss it. So I think one of the ways is if you have the time, you know, find a community that does appreciate that and where you can collaborate with them and 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 do that. And and maybe another way is also to um, include um non-written ethnographic work in your written thesis as well you know there's a theoretical component to it that that you could use to to strengthen your your arguments so so definitely try to do those and um yeah and if if um i'll, I'll keep it at this yeah <laughs> thank you lana that was great Anything else that any of our speakers would like to add to this? Um, yeah, I, I, um, my experience is that people are very welcoming of these methods. Um, and I frankly haven't experienced the kinds of obstacles that maybe are more typical in, for example, visual media, which makes me sad. I'm sorry that you've experienced those obstacles. Um, but I also have um, largely stuck to literary traditions. I do make a lot, quite a lot of art as part of my field work, and I have to date only published one piece of art. So it's possible that I would encounter more obstacles if I tried to publish my art. Um, but I wanted to mention, because there's quite a lot of questions about people who are currently in PhD programs, this book was my dissertation almost exactly. So if you want to see what a dissertation, a successful dissertation, giving myself that credit, looks like that includes creative methods, this is an example of what that looks like. I, I can also jump in, uh, obviously adding to both Lana and Leah. Um, yeah, I mean, even... Even if you end up using, let's say, your own your own photographs, your own images in the in the dissertation, maybe that's kind of already acceptable. Uh, if you're not doing like if they, if you're not allowed to do, let's say, a film or or a performance performance art or something else, even when you use images, there is a way to like talk about um, talk about them these images differently uh, than just an extension. Here is an example of what I just wrote, and then you have the image. So there is a way to incorporate these images, not just as an example of a proof, but uh, uh, analyze them in a way that uh, uh, that has like also theoretical rigor. And in a sense, then you're still, for me, you're still engaging in, in visual anthropology. Um, and in fact, not in a traditional way where it just, you know, you have, we're overwhelmed with these different representations, especially of the other, uh, uncritical and all that. You can actually use images in a way that are theoretical or in a way that can enhance your theoretical framework. So if you can do a film, you can also do that. Uh, use, uh, and again, like I, uh, I hope you're able uh, to, to, to tap into that creative element uh, because it's really, it really can empower your, you know, your PhD uh, journey um, and I also think um, 
if you're unable to use any of this creative method in your dissertation because of whatever reason you have like a very traditional <laughs> committee uh i mean that's that's still part of you so that's still part of your own archive that you're you're developing it's not going to go anywhere it might not go into the dissertation it might go somewhere else that is actually more receptive so keep producing uh, don't don't let these gatekeepers you know from uh stopping you from from kind of going into that direction Thank you. Um, so another relevant question, and Lana, you already shared some programs that would be relevant to these topics, but there was one question also asking for particular grad programs, or you could think about other programs too, that you would suggest people um, who are interested in these issues. Should, should I continue? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I you talked can. about the two visual anthropology uh, MA programs uh, in the Netherlands, so the University of Amsterdam and Leiden. Um, then in the UK, I mentioned uh, Goldsmiths Manchester for the visual anthropology masters and in Manchester also for the PhD. Now, I think there's many more departments in the UK. If, if we look at the European um, context which I'm more familiar with I don't know how uh, where everyone's from, from that's listening in, in this webinar uh, but we also had many people from all around the world uh, and I think the international dimension made it really great um, many other departments are, are you know thinking uh, about setting up new um, degrees for this so that's that's really good um, and so then um, in Denmark at Aarhus University um, and oh, and what I also want to mention is that uh, at the University of, of Manchester, there's also a joint PhD program uh, in performative arts and visual anthropology. So I also know people who have combined these two um, together. So I, I think this is also a really great way of, of thinking multidisciplinary about things. So do do check those out. Yeah. Thank you, Lana. Did I see also Shireen turning on? I was going to answer another question, um, if that's okay. okay. So someone asked about, um, you know, using comics medium for really tough topics, like what's happening now in Gaza. And so yeah. I just wanted to show um, some examples. So Rama Duwaji is a comic artist who, you know, um, who was it who just said this Lana if you have a skill like use it and so you know a lot of us sometimes feel helpless we're looking at the ongoing atrocities in Gaza and what can we do and so she on her own took um, a journalist story about Reem Ahmed an architect who was under the rubble in Gaza for many hours and she made it into panel by panel and um, the Washington Post published it and, and, and I think it's extremely powerful the way she did it again like with comics there's um kind of a simplification so you're not completely overwhelmed by the photorealism and you get to decide how long you want to linger on each image um, in terms of the appropriateness of the genre i just want to say um you know art spiegelman is the guy who really changed the idea that americans had about what can comics do so there's other traditions like the French tradition of bon dessiné. They really understand that comics can do a lot of things, but in the U.S., because it's so um, identified, strongly identified with children, with the simplification of ideas or with superheroes as a genre, um, people were really, really offended by Art Spiegelman relating the story of his father during the Holocaust in comics format because they said this is completely inappropriate this is not respectful to the holocaust victims and on top of that he showed the jews um who were being persecuted by the nazis as mice and the nazis famously as as cats um and that soon died down when people saw what amazing mass appeal art spiegelman's mouse had so i think he was really the the guy who who shifted what comics can do and what comics can mean. And then, you know, after that we get Persepolis and, and a lot of different things. And so it doesn't mean comics are never never always going to be funny, but what, what I meant was that because we tend to associate them with something lighter, we take this in 
a bit easier. And it's absolutely not sanitized. I mean, I think you get the full weight of the horror of living under this situation, but um, somehow it's putting you in the driver's seat instead of kind of being flooded by images. And the other thing I wanted to show for the people who are asking about um, dissertations, well, so uh, University of Toronto Press, so the same one that publishes the ethnographic series, just came out with an eth ethnographic novel. So this is fiction based on um, fieldwork and it's collaborative. So that's coming out this spring. And then the other uh, person I want to mention is Nick Susanis, who was at least, I think, the most well-known guy to have I don't know if he was the first, but the first one who began publishing his dissertation online in terms of comics. And he's using the image actually to um, further sociological theory. And it was so well received online that, you know, before he even finished his dissertation, Harvard University Press gave him a uh, uh, contract and it was published. It's called Unflattening. I encourage people to look at. And and now Nick Susanis is running a huge comic studies program at San Francisco State University. So, I mean, he was in the education department that might already be a bit open to collaboration, but I think that's a big success story. And then I just want to say in response to Leah, um, yeah, because of the logocentrism. So I mean, part of what we're trying to say is the academy is so logocentric. So even if you're experimenting, but you're experimenting within text format, you're using words playfully. Yeah, academics are into that. But it's really harder to get body performance, to get film, to, to incorporate the other senses. And so that's just something to be aware of. Um, and New York University's culture and media program has been going on for, I think, more than 35 years now um, with Faye Ginsburg at the helm. And, and what's really interesting is part of what Faye um, demonstrated is that it's not just that like so many pe more people are interested and, and visuals can be more accessible to them. It broadens you know, learning because everybody has different learning styles and also people with learning disabilities. And so she actually documented that some of the most well-known ethnographic, early ethnographic filmmakers had some form of dyslexia or um, reading impairment, which is really interesting. And then you think of like all the people that you've brought in, right? Um, who just have different ways of seeing and learning. Thank you, Shireen. Um, Leah, did you, did, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I wanted to respond to mm -hmm. Shireen, and there's yeah. also a question for me. Um, mm -hmm. I have dyslexia, so I have all these creative methods in my toolkit because the written word is not my native tongue. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do think that you are absolutely right. For example, I went to UC Irvine, where Shireen is currently, but you were not there when I was there. And um, they were very lenient. I could basically do whatever I wanted. So I took classes in the drama department. I took classes in the dance department. I took classes in the film studies department. And yet I didn't include any of those other modes in my dissertation. I just did poetry. So there was definitely a kind of like unconscious filtering happening. Um, Totally. And even by people who don't believe in it at all, right? Like they'll say, we wish we could include all of these different media, but, and it's like, but then yeah. what's the but if you're now in the role of gatekeeper, right? right. So, yeah, exactly. Because we all know gatekeeping it doesn't have to be somebody with a hat on <laughs> standing by an actual gate. It, it, ha it can happen through these unconscious power systems that we don't even know we're inhabiting. Um, I wanted to on the dyslexia note. I just want to put in a brief plug to my colleague Roxanne Varzi down the hall from me, who just finished a, a novel, fiction novel, um, about uh, it's super interesting and it's a lot of fun. It's called Death in a Nutshell, and hmm. it's like a murder mystery who done it, and the protagonist is an anthropologist with dyslexia. I will check that out. That's great. She was at Irvine when I was there. Um. So somebody asked me about journals that publish ethnographic poetry, particularly about war. And um, 
I was the poetry editor at Anthro and Humanism for several years, and I really enjoyed that. And they, a lot of ethnographic poetry about war has been published there. We even, during my tenure, had a, a couple of journalists who submitted poetry, which I decided to include, even though they weren't anthropologists. Um, Sapiens has a really robust ethnographic poetry department. They have a poet in residence. They have a dedicated poetry division. Um, they're great. So I would recommend checking out Sapiens. Um, I've also published my poems in journals that were, I guess you're asking about, okay, no, just, I have published my poems also in journals that are not academic, such as Consequence Magazine, which focused specifically on the consequences of war and Kenyan Review. So I think one of the benefits of poetry is that it's very mobile. You can move between different readerships pretty easily. Um, and so there's there's quite a lot of places that you can publish this kind of stuff. Great, thank you, Leah. And we have one final question, I think, for Nirus, if our audience does not add anything. So Nirus, um, someone asked about your points on framing and how one can interpret uh, visual content in relation with theoretical analysis. Yeah. Thank you for this question. I mean, the, the most direct ans answer that I have is really uh, to think about, like, for example, I, I, de I look at artists and I look at their artistic production, you know, and whatever images they produce from their exhibit or like this image that I showed Rahida Saad is uh, uh, going to school. Uh, so um, I... One way to do it is to to have to like have an interview with the artist, and that has been and you know part of my my kind of anthropological journey is really to talk to people and to 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 talk about these artists, you know, lived experience, everyday, uh, you know, ordinary uh, everyday experiences, in addition to their interest in producing art. So uh, so talking to artists, I think. Uh, help me understand these images, some of which is already circulating in a way that it's uh, uh, um, not just like in a way that it's not closed within whatever we see in the image. So for example, in Raida Saad's performance, uh, she's she she also actually plays on humor and, and parody and even in, in other in other uh, work that she, uh, she 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 worked on. Uh, in this one, it was kind of there's a there's an ironic element to this, and also absurd because you know people don't go to school with a ladder, um, and she wanted to kind of you know uh, um, emphasize that absurdity and that violence of the wall. But what's interesting is she in the interview she talked to me about how this image became had a life kind of gained a life of itself in social media, especially in Facebook in 2013, where actually it was circulated as a news report that this is a Palestinian girl going to school, even though it's an art performance. So for me, this story wouldn't, wouldn't exist if I didn't talk to the, to the artist. So having kind of a, the whole conversation about, you know, what brought you to think about this uh, this specific art? And you know, and Raida herself actually lives in Jerusalem, so she confronts the wall on a daily basis help me understand uh, the theoretical framing around this image uh, uh, in, a, in a more expansive way. And also in many of my interviews, especially during my PhD, when I interviewed photographers, there was a little bit of uh, 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 sentiments that we lack, we lack some kind of uh, critical vision, uh, especially like some, some, some photographers kind of were, complaining about the, the direct engagement with the militarized landscape. It's just like, okay, you take a picture to show how horrible it is, but this is not enough. So it made me think about to go beyond this illustrative element of capturing an image and to think about whatever kind of conversation and narratives and stories that it generated outside of, of, of the frame itself. Uh, so this is one way to, to try to think about these images as, you know, theoretical provocations. Um, 
and and again it goes kind of it it it, it asks us to when we incorporate images or photographs in our dissertations or in our writing we need to think about uh, that incorporation in a way that it's not just a simple illustration of something but to pose on it to watch it to maybe listen to it to think about how does this image contribute to maybe elaborating on, on other conversations, what is absent, what is uh, not spoken and, and so on. So I think this is what I mean by kind of thinking about these images as maybe like more provoking theoretical uh, uh, conversation and, and expanding uh, theoretical frameworks. I hope this answered. Thank you, Nerus. With that, I think we are at the end of this wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Neiruz, Lana, Shirin, Leo. It was so wonderful to learn from you. Thank you, our coordinators, our audience for being here, for your support, for engaging with this workshop. This was truly a wonderful conversation and I hope we can have many more like this in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. 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 Thank you, Julia.